This group is old enough to leave school and go to work, and because of the conditions at the time, we find many teenagers enjoying kind of incomes and expenditure levels never known before. And we see a whole concept of teenage consumers begin to emerge, and to filter out all sorts of products and ideas uh, within uh, Western markets. So popular design one, the rise of the teenage consumer. Oh, I should say, after the lecture, we are having a workshop from Fiona, from the library, who will be taking you through the essay brief and explaining approaches to writing that essay. Now, the lecture structure is thus. First of all, we're going to recap on our last lecture, 1951, Press for Britain, and then our introduction, the baby boomer generation. We'll be explaining that term, the baby boomer generation, and what it was. Then the main bulk of the lecture I've broken down into three sections. Theme one, the teenage consumer. Actually, there was a marketing report produced in this country called the teenage consumer. We'll be thinking about how advertisers, manufacturers, marketers begin to target a particular group of people with particular messages and uh, products and uh, other consumer durable consumer products, I should say. Then theme two, popular culture and cultural business. We see these ideas around youthfulness and ideas of of affluence and spending. We're also built around Broader motives to do with popular culture. This is no accident. This is also the era of rock and roll and the emergence of pop stars and film stars who seem to um, perfectly convey this idea. So we're going to think of popular culture. It's also the period in which television starts to become a feature of people's lives. And then theme three, design to art and birth of pop. We see emerging out of this. New ideas. Again, it's one of these moments when principally the ideas that we're looking at are being first explored and investigated by artists and painters. But what's interesting is they're using design as the material for new ideas around art and directly referencing ideas drawn from design into what becomes known as pop art. Again, this emerges in this period both in Britain and London principally and in New York as well. So that's the structure for our lecture, then our roundup, then our conclusions, then our further reading. Now, our last lecture, we were looking at two episodes that occurred in Britain, one in the 1940s, one in the very early 1950s. The first was the British Jamaica Exhibition held in 1946 at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Here we see the Council of Industrial Design puts on a show that is both meant to educate the public about notions of good taste and good design, whilst at the same time explaining its role as a kind of promoter of good design to industry as well. We saw the display of both kind of tableaus that aim to explain what design was and what its role and function was. And also products, British products, that were going to set the world on fire. And what was amazing for all the people that went to visit this, and it was a very, very popular show, in a very short time it ran, so one and a half million people fire on food. It was an exhibition of bread bins and kettles and cutting boards. Hardly the kind of stuff now that sets the horses racing. It just shows us how starved of consumer products and light and glamour people must have felt in 1946, an era when there's still, we would have seen bomb destruction on virtually every high street in most major towns and cities, we would have been subject to rationing, a lot of the world around us would have been pretty well unmaintained for the years of the war, so Britain at this point would have been seen to us a very bleak and rather grim place. And Britain can make it, just offered this kind of beacon of hope. On the back of Britain to make it, a far more ambitious project involving government and all sorts of agencies and, of course, the Council of Industrial Design was devised in order to celebrate, uh, really, Britain's emergence as a new kind of country after the Second World War. It was called the Festival of Britain and it was held symbolically in the year 1951, exactly 100 years after the Great Exhibition of 1851. 
what the best of Britain sought to do was to kind of show Britain what the future would look like. And design was used both as a vehicle for conveying ideas about the future, it was used to convey ideas about the connections between science and technology and the arts, and also it was used to actually give a kind of material expressions to what modern lifestyle would look like. It would involve furniture, strange bits of public art, organised public spaces, new kinds of buildings. What we see emerging from the Festival of Britain was really a sort of triumph of British modernism. Really. The very people that had come to the fore in the Second World War, who were so intellectually influential in organisations like the Council of Britain, were exactly the same people that were organising and putting on the show. And in many ways, this kind of vision of Britain was very accurate. If we think about all those concrete um, spaces in the centre of many of our towns and cities, the pedestrian walkways, the shopping centres, lots of these were actually informed by ideas of what public space could and should be. The street architecture we're also familiar with, the lighting, the signage, the seats, the concrete flower bowls, and rubbish bins, all these kinds of things really notice are so ubiquitous. We actually see first emerging as part of this kind of project to create organised modern spaces for this organised modern country. And Britain can make it, there's also a showcase for young British design talent. Ernest Ray, Robin Day, his wife Lucy and Day. All these people have, were shown uh, as major exhibitors in the Festival of Britain uh, itself, as of course were young British artists from the period. So that was our story last week, and on to this week, Pop and Design War. Now I'd like to start with our introduction with the idea of kind of a baby boomer generation. The phrase itself comes from America and it was used to describe this peculiar phenomenon that we can see happening. Now here, not only does it happen in America, it happens across Western Europe as well. But this is actually a birth rate chart for America in the 20th century when we are dealing with the first century. See, in the very early years of the decade, there was relative affluence in America, a high birth rate. In the early 20s and 30s, that drops dramatically. Look how that red line drops down. That was during the period in the 20s and 30s of economic turmoil, after the Wall Street crash. And this didn't only happen in America, we see throughout West, the Western economies uh, collapsing. see in the 1930s and into the 1940s as the war begins to happen, the economy picks up, and we see a massive spike in the birth rate. You can see red goes blue, it just shoots up. Look at that vertical line that goes from red to blue there, peaking in 1944. 1944, of course, would be the year that John Lennon was born, and many of those 1960s pop stars. What we see is in the 1940s spike of the birth rate. This becomes known as the baby boomer generation. It's a phrase imported from America, but it now has wide usage. And of course, all these people being born in the late 1930s and into the 1940s, by the 1950s, when we see the birth rate begin to calm down again, are themselves teenagers and young adults. So it's this generation who are coming of age in the post-war years, and there are lots of see from demographic statistics that there is this spike in the birth rate. So there's a huge amount of young people all coming of age into this post-war world. And it's also a world that brings new ideas and excitement along <coughs> with it. You see how well the whole idea of a consumer, uh, of a teenager, so it comes out of this realisation that so many of them are around. Also, the post-war world is very different, as we shall see, from the pre-war world. The experiences of this generation do not have to fight in the Second World War, but have had the benefits of the peacetime economy immediately following the Second World War. Very, very different to the experiences of their parents. New technologies are also bringing with them, on the back of them, new forms of 
experience. The reason we have rock and roll, the reason three people can make so much noise is for electricity. First of all, you can amplify this noise using initially microphones and then other forms of electronics. Also, with electricity, you can record this noise, which means that you can capture it. And also, with electricity, you can distribute it and you can play it again and again and again. Rock and roll is really a byproduct of electrification. It's young people having access to new technologies and new experiences and having on the back of that new products wrapped up and presented to them. Of course, this is the year of the birth of pop music, modern pop music as we would know it. And the trajectory of our own popular music from our own period now goes right back to this period of electrification, the emergence of records and record players and the ability of people to consume this stuff at distance on television screens, on film screens, on radio, and of course, on their own music record players as well. And pop music is just one element of this. <coughs> you see, as the <coughs> West is creating new forms of entertainment, the whole idea of the teenager becomes kind of central to this. In America, they emerge after the war as the wealthiest nation on earth. There's full employment, there's no bomb damage. It has advanced industrial processes. It's the world of Coca-Cola, Cadillac cars, and electric household goods, and tin food, and some coffee, chewing gum, and of course, Hollywood. Hollywood is vitally important because most people's experience of America on this planet would have been gleaned from watching films produced by the Hollywood film system. So films themselves are an important mediator, an idea about what a high-consuming, rich country actually looks like, because this is what people are seeing. Most people are not American, they're seeing it through the prison, the cinema lens. And what they're also seeing is a new generation of film stars, irreverent, young, troubled, articulating the kind of complexities of life that young people felt. Because we also know from the historic record and from research that this is also an age when people become increasingly self-conscious that in America the idea of all this affluence and wealth and privileged middle class backgrounds and upbringing brings with it a kind of questioning of that. And stars such as Marlon Brando uh, and James Dean here epitomise the kind of the flip side of the American dream is it? the only glamorous, dangerous thing. And often the starring in films that themselves were considered problematic at the time. Dean himself, of course, died at the very height of his success in 1956 in a car crash, driving his Porsche Fox car uh, and crashed into another car. His fellow actor at the time, Marlon Brando, starring in films like The Wild One, very troubled films about bike against taking over you know, town. You see also this parallels the rise of people like Elvis Presley and rock and roll. So America isn't only giving us fast cars and tin food and chewing gum, it's also giving us the whole concept of a teenager as this kind of troubled, rather frightening person, a person in conflict with the parental generation. Another phrase that begins to emerge at this time is used to explain this is the generation gap. The seeming space of incomprehensibility between one generation and the next, i.e. The, the teenagers of this period and their parents. And this phrase, the generation gap, is used to explain this gap of, uh, of understanding and knowledge. And when you think about it, of course there's going to be a kind of generation gap. Because the parental generation, the people whose sons and daughters are those teenagers in the 1950s, their own early years were marked often by poverty, of course by strife, many of them end up fighting in the war. We see the recessions throughout the West industrialized economies. Well, the real hardship, you know, in this country, in America, across Europe, the 20s and 30s, for lots of people, when the teenagers of the 50s, their parents were teenagers, they were experiencing very, very difficult lives. 
They didn't have pop music, record players, instrument copies, and disposable income. What they had was poverty, unemployment, and of course, bookends by two world wars. The First World War at the beginning of the century, and the Second World War in the middle of it. So the lives of those parents were very different. And when confronted with the seeming affluence of the 1950s and the ability of their children coming of age, leaving school, getting jobs, having money, to experience a whole range of pleasures and entertainments and options and aspirations they simply did not have, of course creates a sense of incomprehensibility between the different generations. We see this also being a popular theme in literature, in films, in pop music, the idea that the parents just don't understand it and what's wrong with them. This emerges as a kind of popular cultural motif in itself and becomes part of the kind of packaging up and commodification, I would say, of teenagers. So we see in this the idea of the teenager in itself is new that the generational experiences kind of underline difference, that those people coming of age in the 1950s were able to enjoy levels of income, full employment throughout the westernised countries, a demand for workers that meant that working people earned good money, and also these people, these teenagers, these young people who are neither adults nor children, are in the workplace earning money, but they're not buying houses, they're not having children, they themselves don't have the responsibility, the full responsibility of adulthood, but they have money to spend and they have leisure time with which to spend that money. So, we've set up the scene, we've considered the idea of the youthful generation coming on tap at exactly the point we're looking What we also see increasingly is the idea that this is a marketable messages, products, aimed straight at them. And the phrase the teenage consumer was actually coined and taken from this, the book, The Teenage Consumer. Well, I call it the book, it was a piece of market research written by one Mark Abram. It had various publications. The first one comes out in 1959, and you see the cover of it here. Now, Abrams himself had founded a market research British, they founded Market Research, Research Services Limited, which was a market research company. And what the organisation did was to conduct social and market research projects. The information was used by the main political parties, it was used by the advertising industry, it was used by marketeers, and of course it was also used by academics with an interest in social shifts and demographics as well. In 1958-59, Abrams conducted a survey into the lives of teenagers, and the teenage consumer was the result of this. The work was aimed at both government departments <coughs> and industries to try and understand the lives of teenagers and their spending power. And it was the first fully, uh, first full attempt to kind of create a picture of teenage Britain in terms of its spending. Now, one of the things that Abrams did was to actually work out how many people fall into the bracket of teenagers in Britain at this particular period. And he points out this demographic shift has occurred where suddenly there are lots more teenagers because of this rising birth rate in the 1930s and 1940s. So he's actually able to say, look, you know, this is how many teenagers there are. This is how this group of people have actually grown, and so therefore there's an, an impact and effect on the demographics of this country. And through questionnaires, through stopping young people in the streets, through visits to places like youth centres and other places where young people congregate, Abrams researchers ask questions about what do you spend your money on, essentially, in order to understand young people. Lives. We see here lists from the teenage consumer. This one here, for instance, is women's media 
standing. You can see Rebelli, woman, woman's very, weak head, titbits, Valentine's, woman's mirror, woman's mirror, Marilyn, Mirabelle, Roxy, Romeo. Comics, magazines, teen publications aimed at young women. Because these are important and significant because people want to know how effective their advertising is going to be if carried in these kinds of titles. They need to know what kind of people are buying them and what kind of numbers. We also see here a breakdown of consumable goods in terms of spending that young people are consuming. So their weekly pay packet, what is actually going on. And we see actually it's probably not that much different from teenagers now. I recognise some of these things from my own son and daughter's lives. Top of the list, chocolates and sweets. Again, soft drinks, meals out, worrying at number four, alcoholic drinks. And even more worrying at number five, cigarettes and tobacco. Perhaps they wouldn't be so heavy now. Footwear, men's clothing, women's clothing. It's interesting that men's clothing always being spent by your men on clothing. Bicycles, motorcycles, etc. Personal transport, looking at records and records sites, books and magazines, cosmetics, etc. etc. So it went on. Abrams building this picture of beautiful young lifestyles through what they're actually consuming. And this was important and significant for lots of people because it was a way of identifying and targeting young people in order that their lifestyles could be understood so that advertisers and manufacturers could exploit ideas about those lifestyles, those experiences, begin to aim messages and products straight at this group of people. Here we see images of a teen media in the 1950s with its emphasis on romance, pop stars, Film. These kinds of titles were hugely popular. Young people who won't spend are actually buying into a print media. We see lots and lots of examples. An explosion, in fact, of what we might think of as a young, youthful pop media in the 1950s. Very different from the 1930s. These kinds of titles and these kinds of messages didn't exist in this way. Also, Products aimed directly and squarely at these people. Baby shampoo. The product I think still with really, you can still buy baby shampoo, can't we? Can we buy baby shampoo? First appeared in this country in the 1950s. And what it was was an attempt to create a dream for young women. What market research and manufacturers found that products were places where men went. That there wasn't much for a young woman in a club, so therefore why would many young people want to go to the club? That's difficult because the boyfriend wants to go to the club, but the young woman doesn't, and you know, let's you know, let's go to the cinema instead. Well, the drinks industry is keen on going to get as many young people into clubs as possible, spending money. So champagne, uh, so baby shampoo, who the mark himself is the champagne Perry, it was a kind of lightly alcoholic pear juice, fizzy pear juice was launched at that teenage female market. The powder blue colouring that Baby Shan still uses was very much a teen colour of the time. Baby blues, pad blue, baby pinks, these kinds of colours were very popular within kind of teen fashions and teen products. The logo itself of the little young uh, deer with the little blue ribbon around its neck, drawn from a kind of Disney kind of perspective, childlike, was used again as a kind of pop come on. And if we think of the ashtray shape itself, it's references to hearts as well. And it's interesting that not only do you try and get the other one drinking, but I don't know, give them an ashtray, don't they? And a bag as well while having a baby shell. For me, it's quite troubling now, but in the context of the 1950s, this was a very obvious piece of marketing. Here we see sweets and confections. Remember, at the top of Abram's list came the chocolate, sweets, and confections. This was the big seller. And we can see here British manufacturers aiming sweet advertising at the teenage audience. <coughs> We've got references to Blue Denny, 
and dancing there. This would have been seen, read, and understood by that market as being a reference to them and their lifestyle. It's for Spaniards. And notice the statement here. Spaniards, the modern way to buy sweets. Here we've got fries crunch box. It's time for a crunch. Look at the word there. Wow. Coming out of the mouth. Again, phraseology like wow. Phraseology like wow. Comes from kind of American popular teen language. It's popular like Super Pop Music and films and the rest of it. And phrases like that. Wow. Start coming into the broader kind of British uh, vocabulary. It describes itself as the new milk chocolate sensation. And here we have white head at Topping. And we see a girl in a pedal pushers <coughs> and a halter neck and a ponytail riding a scooter, grabbing white head at Topping out, gaming as she rides down the high street. All these messages aim squarely at a young teenage audience with money in its pockets. Here we see an image of young people dancing from the 1950s. Here we see an advertisement for a cigarette featuring young people dancing and record player. Even in the background, look, they're kind of referencing in this lamp and that curtain there. It's kind of pressed with different types of design. That is directly referencing Lucy and Ben textiles, that that bit of artwork there. Enjoying dancing together, being young, enjoying their clothes, their lifestyle, and so enjoying a cigarette. And we see new products emerge that become accessible to young people. In many ways, this dance set record player was the iPod of its time. What you could do with this record player, which is astonishing, bearing in mind this was the age of the seven inch vinyl CD. Most pop music was consumed on a seven inch format. It's a disc of vinyl, seven inches in diameter. It rotates at 45 rotations minute and on that is recorded sound. What this enables you to do with this large spindle of moving arm is to stack up to ten singles onto one onto that spindle. When you press go, the arm came across, one drop down, plays it, the next one drop down, plays it, the next one drop down. Imagine that playlist of ten songs. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. Ten songs. Can't imagine what having ten songs on like the other it also came with a handle to take it to your friend's house. Now, of course, our iPods are like that bit, and this would have been like carrying a massive suitcase, and it would have weighed a few pounds as well. It would have had valves in it, it would have been sort of a heavy piece of kit to carry around. But this was the state of the art in terms of music technology at the time. And crucially, even though in itself it was relatively expensive, credit was also made available young people for what was called higher purchase. Now this is an era before people have credit cards. And what would happen was, if you had a parent or a guardian who was a householder, they could sign the paperwork for you, which was an agreement that you would pay X amount of shillings per week back to a finance company in order to repay the loan that you borrowed. It was called higher purchase. So you do the form, you get the money, and then once a week you pay some money off. So to higher purchase, all you needed was your parents to sign the form. To higher purchase, young people could access lump sums through which they could buy products like this. So even credit was developed and involved to help pull in this teenage market. Here we see products aimed directly <coughs> at young women, referencing through words and images ideas about being young. To start, the Gossard bra on the left hand side here was called the 17. This product titled the 17, referring directly to the teenager. The text is interesting 17, the age of feminine loveliness is being formed. In other words, when your body is beginning to change shape, you begin to take on a more feminine uh, outline. This is when you Teenage to maturity, as well. We have here a minor twin stick. This look, 
it's new, it's cool. Again, words like cool were being imported from American popular culture in itself to like the jazz language. It is in fact uh, uh, it's a twin stick lipstick with double colours on it. I love that girl's face staring manically at the minus twin stick. And here we have the for the teenagers clothes aimed at audience. Company with the companies that are still with us now, Dolph Sis Footwear Company and Clark produced teenage footwear at the time. Clark even called his name teenagers. The other popular name for these flat slip on shoes were log rollers. Here we see Dolph Sis with their range of log rollers aimed at teenage women buyers. And of course the images, the words that shape that message refer to teenage lifestyle. So we can see, actually, you know, the things Abrams uncovers and packages up and presents, actually we can see these were readily exploited and used to produce products and commercial messages aimed squarely at that teenage audience. Now, the things we looked at came from Britain, but we didn't take any snapshots of, say, France or Germany. Of course, Americans seen very similar things at this period of time as well. And again, throughout Western Europe and America, we see ideas about popular culture begin to emerge, which are influencing <coughs> ideas and behavior. Now, all this affluence that young people were suddenly having access to and were enjoying spending itself creates issues and problems. We see a space of books, films dealing with the idea of young people in quite a sort of frightened, paranoid way. This book here, The Uses of Literacy by Sir Richard Hobbit, was a study by Hobbit who'd grown up in working class in the 1920s and 30s, going back to those same neighbourhoods in the 1950s and thinking about how people's lives have changed. And he spends an enormous amount of time criticising young people and their garish clothes and their penchant for coffee bars and loud music. It's almost as if these people, just, you know, they are wasting their lives with the kind of shallowness of consumption. We also see a rash of, in Hollywood and British films and around, a rash of films featuring the idea of young criminals and use of criminality. A <coughs> uh, key example in this country would be uh, The Blue Lamp, which is a film uh, starring Dixon and Doc Green, who get shot by a young robber at the end. Kosh Boy would be another example film about young teenage delinquents. And America is producing endless variations on the kind of teenage criminal, teenage hoover, teenage danger on the film. A book that appeared in this country Saturday night and Sunday morning was very interesting. I have in front of me a very copy of Saturday night and Sunday morning. And it's a kind of a moral book in which Alan Sillington talks about the weekend of one particular young man, a working class young man living in Nottingham called Arthur Seaton. And the book follows Seaton from Saturday <coughs> night through to Sunday as he reflects on his life. Seaton works at the, well it's not made explicit where he works, but we pretty well understand that he works at the Rally Bicycle Factory in Nottingham. He had a huge manufacturing Seaton himself is an amoral character. He's not, he, he's not troubled by any kind of issues of morality. The only person he's interested in is himself. And his reflections in the book are all about his reflections on himself and his life. He has, have, he's having affairs with a number of women. Some are married, some aren't. Simultaneously, none of which know about each other. Himself, in the late 50s, when this was produced, was a very shocking uh, 
uh, element of the story. It's a brilliant book, by the way, uh, film. The film is available in the library here. I could recommend, just if you're interested in stylish menswear, it's worth watching. But it's a really interesting film. And what Seaton does is he works every hour he can, he does as much overtime as he can, not because he's a good man and a good worker, because he wants money. All he's interested in is money. The more he works, the more money he gets. And then when he gets that money at the weekend, he spends it. And what's he spending on? He spends it on drink, and he spends it on clothes, and he spends it on having a good time. And this was, you know, considered at the time a very kind of amoral kind of book that you can't just have this standing back and not taking his side. That Seaton was obviously a very flawed character and that he shouldn't have been condemned, but Silito doesn't do that. What Silito chooses to do is just to say, well, this is how young people are. An interesting excerpt from it talks about Arthur Seaton when he gets back from the factory and he's changing into his clothes to go out. Because of course people work on Saturday morning then for their own time. So he gets back in preparation for going out on Saturday afternoon and spirit evening. And to quote from the book, Arthur washed loudly in the scullery, swilling waves of warm soapy water over his chest and face, blundering his way back to the fire to dry himself. Upstairs he flung his greasy overalls aside and selected a suit from a line of hangers. Brown paper protected them from dust, the suit that is, and he stood for some minutes in the cold, digging his hands into pockets and turning back the pelts, sampling a good hundred pounds worth of property hanging from an iron bar. These were his riches, and he told himself that money paid out on clothes was a sensible invest investment because it made him feel good as well as look. And it's this kind of amorality in the story that people found so troubling. And was symptomatic of this kind of incomprehension that an older generation had at this young, affluent, mobile, high spending teenage generation. Another important factor coming into people's lives, initially in America, but by the early 1950s in this country, was television. In 1950, there were 350,000 television sets. By within two years, that had leapt to two million. And so it kept growing. By the end of the 1950s, virtually every household had access to television. We also see, in this country, the emergence of tele uh, commercial television in the middle of the 1950s. Now, in Britain, the BBC, initially, was the only broadcast of television, one channel. And it saw its mission as to inform that the television was a system by which people could be informed. A kind of old-fashioned, modernist idea. The first licenses were, commercial, were granted to commercial television channels in 1956. And suddenly this was a game changer, because these people relied on advertising, not on license payer money. So they had to produce popular programming that wasn't about the government getting out important messages, but was about pulling in audiences. And what we see is the importing from America where <coughs> commercial television dominates are all those kinds of ideas. So we see quiz shows, game shows, comedies. We also see programs aimed at younger audiences featuring pop stars, dancers, music, entertainment in that kind of way. And Britain itself sees a rash of television programs aimed at young people, featuring music, featuring dancing. Oh Boy and Six Five Special being both on the ITV network, appearing in the late 1950s, both of which platformed music and dancing to young people. So, popular culture itself is reflecting these ideas. We see it in films, we see it in novels, we see it in pop music, of course. We see it in television. We see the whole idea of being a teenager, being a young, given a kind of popular cultural expression through these kinds of outlets and problems. And we also see influencing in the arts these, are, well, these ideas having an influence 
in the arts as well. And in our final, final section, thing three, design into art, and the first pop, we will look at that. Now I'll start <coughs> with a quote by Ray and Abandon. Now the eagle eye amongst you, of course, will recognise that Ray and Abandon is the writer Himself wrote this essay, Vehicles of Desire, in 1955, very much in the independent group kind of mindset. And he said this We're still making do with Plato, we're talking about the arts, so we're still, we're still making do with Plato. Plato was from ancient Greece, the idea that you can find perfection, platonic perfection. So he says, We're still making do with, but essentially, philosophy from ancient Greece, because in aesthetics, as in most other things, we still have no formulated intellectual attitudes and living in a throwaway economy. Of course, the other side of all this is that these people were increasingly, this is another thing that appears to be the case, leading these very ephemeral lives, buying this today, getting rid of it, replacing it. The idea of high consumption itself linked to disposability was kind of threatening theory. So he's saying there was no actual intellectual attitudes connected to living in the throwaway country. We eagerly consume noisy ephemera, here in a band today, gone with a whimper tomorrow. Movies, beachwear, pulp magazines, this morning's headlines and tomorrow's television programmes. Yet we insist on an aesthetic and moral standard its permanency, its permanency, durability, and perennity. What he's saying there is the rest of us live in a world where, you know, we're consuming television programs, newspapers, fast food, we're watching films. Yet, for some reason, the arts attempts to promote this idea of perfection, of stasis, of cultural attainment. When, in fact, when we look around our lives, it's continually moving around. There is no durability. We're constantly on the moon, constantly tourists, constantly grazing from you know, experiences. And he was championing the kind of works that the young British artists were beginning to produce that were themselves informed by this emerging consumer culture. One of those very earliest practitioners of this new art form was Eduardo Paolos, and he was his Sacco source. Collage from 1948, essentially featuring bits of Americana, transferred to sausages, Disney characters, American war planes, all with this primary colour scheme as well, abstracting, yet also directly referencing the <coughs> of consumption of consumer products. Richard Hamilton's Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing. And hers is a lush, lush, lush situation. The one on the left hand side, just what is it that makes today's hands, etc., is a collage, ironically pieced together from bits of consumer information. The other side, hers is a lush situation, is equating the idea of eroticism with American car design. What both of them are talking about are the pleasures and sexiness of consumption. Also, the ephemeral quality of life in a society where wants and needs are just produced all the time through consumer products. Here today with the band, gone tomorrow with the winter. And they're commenting on and enjoying this idea of this kind of constant cultural churn that modernity is presenting and the fact that we're all being turned <coughs> into consumers of this. Peter Blake, self portrait of badges in 1961, featuring denim jeans, baseball boots, 
And of course, one of these fan mags, where he put my face face in, held it. And his building door, where he literally forced the door, or got hold of an old door, and put pin-ups of uh, film stuff, and he called it furniture. What emerges, what critics begin to describe this work as, is pop-up, because it's referencing popular culture. It's drawing on popular culture, because design, commercial design, is very much part of that popular and what they're railing against is exactly the kind of modernism, British modernism, that we see being showcased at the 1951 Festival of Britain. The leading artists of the day were not those pop artists, they were the young ones coming up on the inside. It's the Sutherland, the Moore, the Hefty, the Minton, the Nicholson. It's exactly these kind of people who themselves have been informed by those earlier generations of European modernists that the pop artists are challenging to their work. They're producing work that is deliberately provocative, that is challenging, that attempts to question the durability of art. That art, like everything else, is just <coughs> like any consumer product, it's constantly in the state of churn and flux. Therefore, we can't promote permanent the idea of durability a style, a thought that is going to last forever. Because it's just not like that. What they were interested in was the images and ideas and sensations that a rapidly expanding consumer market is throwing at you. The artworks and packaging, the experience of all these things lined up together in itself becomes this kind of abstract language. And it doesn't matter what it is, it could be an advert, a spam, or a pin up of a new girl. It's all part of this massive tidal wave, a tsunami of ideas and information that we're constantly being exposed to on a daily basis. Another member of the independent group, Lawrence Alloway, wrote this in 1958. Mass production techniques apply to accurately repeatable words, pictures, and music. <coughs> resulted in an expendable multitude of signs and symbols. To approach this exploding field of ideas of the uniqueness of art is crucial. Acceptance of the mass media tends to shift what culture is. Instead of reserving the world of Christ artifacts in the known discourse of this it needs to be used more widely as a description what society does. So I always say, you know, it's not about culture. Isn't this thing where we, we find the very best examples of and I found that. The inference, of course, is that's the answer. It's this top ten, the very best examples. What he's saying is we've got to actually redefine what it is. Because in a world where television, where pop music, where mass media constantly changes ideas and messages and images, that we are living through this. The idea of permanency is being able to stop the world and say, this is what is great. It's just, you know, it's a nonsense. What art and culture has to reflect is the times it lives in. And the times it's currently existing in it is informed by the mass media. <coughs> and we see not only Britain with people like Blake and Hamilton, but also in New York. Again, fascination with the ideas of ephemeral language, signs and symbols, things drawn from culture that just become reduced, rendered as a piece of artwork. So, Jasper John's American flag is a commentary on that. This is his uh, target uh, collage here. He's using found objects, he's also using well established signs and symbols, the Euclid stuff, the banner, the tar, the <coughs> MOT, simple, easily read symbols in order to talk about this world of ephemera. And of course, Warhol is part of this pop movement as well. He just simply looks at the supermarket shelves, he sees racks of Campbell soup lined up and says, well, that is art. That is what art is in the 20th century. And Lichtenstein is 
did the same thing by looking at the comments and the ephemeral form of the publishing. So you see, in this period, the idea of a teenager becomes both exploited by the marketeers and advertisers. We see there are more young people of that age group appearing. And we see how an, an emerging mass media, a mass media based on television and film, popular newspapers and magazines, all of which are informing people's ideas about what they are, what they should be, and what they should hope to aspire to. That in turn challenges things that have gone before, whether it's the generation gap and the teenager seemingly in top of the parent, or whether it's the pop artist challenging the idea of modern art, we see this process in the way. And out of it emerges both this very kind of rampant commercial culture and this explosive demand for pop art alongside that. Now let's round up and what we covered. There's a huge rise in the number of those people.
see both design and art engaging in the reductive process that presents a world which is simply a mass of signs and symbols. Now, where can we find out more about this idea of mass? Well, here are some of the books I used to put this lecture together, all of which are available in the library here. But Dick Hedridge is finding in the library. Section 2 is really good. There's a brilliant essay on scooters and from the emergence of pop in the late 1950s, early 60s. The 50s by Peter Lewis, it's quite an old book now. I think it was actually written in the late 70s. But it's a good, fun, general history of Britain in the 1950s. Very accessible. His book is using a lot in the French kind of lectures. Nigel White is pop design, modernism to mod, especially chapters three and four. And the more of fashion bent, Elizabeth Wilson and Ruth Taylor's Through the Looking Gas, chapter five. So, there are some sources. 